Okay, so we're back inside, and the first thing we have to do to actually start uh, processing our files is actually get them onto the computer organized. And I'm actually gonna start with the camera um, because uh, in playback mode on the camera, it's really easy to actually understand which files are which because um, most cameras have an info button that then gives you some metadata about the file uh, in playback mode. And uh, that way I can just quickly see not only um, visually what kind of file it is. So obviously the ones with stars will be lights and the ones that's all uh, bright like this is a flat. But when it comes to the files that are completely black like bias and darks, it's hard to differentiate those without the metadata. So looking in the upper left-hand corner here, it tells us the shutter speed. And so a dark would have a shutter speed that's the same as the light, two, two seconds, while a bias frame would have a shutter speed that's one eight thousandth of a second, which is the fastest uh, shutter speed this camera can do. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna open up uh, Notepad on my Windows computer here. Uh, there's also a program called Text Edit on Mac. Both of these are just quick note-taking uh, applications. And I'm gonna type in lights, darks, bias, flats, because that's the order that I took these files in. And I'm just gonna take note here of the file names, the range uh, of each type. So we can see the first light here is ends in 831, the file name. So I'm just gonna type in 831 dash. And then I'm gonna press the zoom out button and just use my uh, scroll wheel here. to scroll down until we see something that doesn't look like a light frame, meaning we don't see the Milky Way anymore. It'll turn probably completely black eventually. Took a lot of light frames. There we go. Okay, so you can see starting with 1135, this is a completely black frame. And because it's two seconds, I know that it's a dark. So the, f the last uh, light frame is 1112. And then I guess I deleted some files, probably because the clouds came in. And then the first dark frame is 1135. Okay, now I'll just keep scrolling until up there in the upper left hand side of the screen, it changes from two seconds to one eight thousandths of a second. And then I know this is my last dark frame. So one, one, eight, zero. And my first bias frame is one, one, eight, one. Okay, and then I'll just keep scrolling until we get to the flats. Looks like I took about a hundred bias frames. There we go. 1280 is the last bias frame. And then my first flat frame is 1437. I know that's a, a huge jump there in numbers. Um, I deleted some things from the card just to make this a little bit uh, easier. Um, so then I'll just keep scrolling, whoops. And my last flat frame is 1465. Okay, so now I have everything, all of the information that I need to organize these files because I have the file names and uh, the numbers here and what type of file they are. And so now what I can do is I can just remove the memory card from the camera and take my memory card reader here. And this is a nice USB 3 memory card reader that's nice and fast for transferring the files to the computer. It's made by Kingston. And it also has slots for other type of memory cards if you have a camera with CF or something else. Um, Okay, and it says blah, 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 I don't care. It opens up that in the File Explorer. If you're on Mac, this would be Finder. 
And uh, if it if it does, if your memory card opens up in some other program, some photos application, just close out of that. We don't need it. What we're going to do now with uh, this window open over here and our notepad file here is we're going to copy the files off of the memory card onto the computer. But before we do that, um, let's make some empty folders to transfer them to. So I'm going to make a new folder on the desktop. Just right click and choose new folder and I'll call this Lagoon. And then inside my Lagoon folder, I'm going to make four subfolders just the same way. Right click new folder and I'm going to make one for lights, one for darks, one for bias, and one for flats. Okay, now with these two windows open, here's my memory card. I'm gonna go in here into my picture files, and here's my empty folders on my desktop. I'm gonna start with lights. And so lights go from 831 to 1112. So I'm gonna open up my lights folder, over here on my memory card, I'm gonna click on the first file, 831, and scroll down until I get to 1112. There it is, and hold down Shift and click. And so Shift click makes it so that you can grab the whole list of files. Then I'll just left click and drag to drag these 282 files over to my lights folder and let go. And it copies them. Okay, the copying is done. So now I'm gonna go back a folder just by clicking on Lagoon. And next I'll go into Darks. So I'll click on the Darks folder. It says the folder is empty. Then I'll just copy over from 1135 to 1180. So I'll click once on 1135, scroll down, shift click on 1180, copy those to my Darks folder. Well, that's going, I can look the next, it's bias 1181 to 1280. So open up my bias folder, click on 1181, scroll down to 1280, shift click and click and drag 100 bias files. Okay, and then finally flats is everything else here. So we'll just copy those over to the flats folder and then we'll be done. Okay, all done. The only other thing I wanna say about um, file organization here is uh, that if you, you are using Deep Sky Stacker, um, when it stacks together all of these bias frames to make a master bias, it leaves that master bias file uh, in this folder. So if you have a previous project that you worked on and you still um, have all of these folders, look in your bias folder and there's a master bias file in there that then you can reuse for project after project. You don't have to um, take the bias frames all over again and restack them. You can save some time just by reusing a master bias file. So that's why I, I shot 100 bias frames just to get a really good um, master bias file. And then we don't have to actually shoot those bias frames again. We can reuse that master bias file over and over again. Okay, I'll close out of this stuff. And now let's go ahead and open up Deep Sky Stacker here. Okay, this is Deep Sky Stacker 4.2.3, the 64-bit version. The first thing I'm gonna do here is go down here to settings and go to stacking settings. And right here where it says temporary file files, where it says temporary files folder, you can see that I have mine set up to an external drive, the D drive, which is just a, 
an external hard drive I have connected. Um, but yours might be um, on the local drive. And that's fine as long as you have plenty of hard drive space. But um, if you don't, for some reason, I would recommend setting this up um, to where you want it to go, where you have plenty of space, because these temp files can get really, really big. Like it, since we're stacking hundreds and hundreds of frames, these, these temp files can get up to like 60 gigabytes. Now they are temp files, meaning they're temporary. They only are, are there when you have the program open. And then when you close the program, they're deleted from your hard drive, but still you need the space. So if you're working off a fairly small, like startup drive, like an SSD, um, you may want to, uh, pick a different location for this temporary files folder like I did. Okay, with that said, we can now open up our picture files. This means our lights. And so I'm just gonna navigate here to the desktop and then to my Lagoon folder into my lights subfolder. And I'll just click on any of them and then press Control A to select all and click open. Okay, it brings them in. Um, for some reason, uh, Deep Sky Stacker has this quirk where I think it's because you could just bring in all of your frames all at once and it let it try to figure out which are your light, dark, and flat, and biased. But I really wouldn't recommend that because it might mess something up. So what I usually do is I just bring in my light frames first, but none of them are checked right now. So then I go over here and just click check all. Okay, and then it tells me I have 282 light frames. Okay, then I can click over here on the left-hand side under open picture files where it says dark files. Just go to my darks folder and again, click, press control A and open up all my dark files. And it tells me I have 46 of those. Then I'll open up my flat files. Open those, 29. And finally my bias files. open. Okay, we're not using dark flats. Uh, you usually only need to use dark flats if you're shooting really, really long flats, like 30 seconds or something like that. Uh, uh, if you're using a slow scope or something like that. Uh, but we, we shot very quick flats, so we're, I'm not worried about dark current noise, and we don't need to correct the flats with dark flats. Anyways, uh, we have all of this set up now. Um, we can now go on to this red highlighted thing down here that says register checked pictures. Okay. Um, let's start with the main uh, window here under actions. So we have register already registered pictures. These are not already registered, so we can leave that unchecked. We have automatic detection of hot pixels. It's fine to leave that checked. We have stack after registering. I'm gonna go ahead and check that. I want to just do this all in one process. Sometimes you break it up and you might wanna register first and then look at the scores and do different things with that. But let's just keep this simple and stack after registering. Um, I have 282 frames. So I'm going to tell it to select the best 90, 5% of pictures and stack those. So it's going to throw out the worst of the five, the five, worst 5% of the pictures, which I'm fine with. Uh, I think there's some which have maybe some passing clouds or some where maybe I'm, I'm re reframing and the stars are, are, are streaked. And it, Deep Sky Stacker will do a good job of finding those kinds of things and throwing them out because they won't be considered in the best 95%. Okay, I'm gonna go over here to advanced and just make sure that my star detection threshold is okay. I don't remember what the default is, but let's just start at 20%. And then press compute the number of stars. And it found 117. If I bring that star detection threshold down like that, you can see that it finds slightly more stars. And if I bring it up, it will find fewer stars. Um, so at 36%, it's only finding 59 stars, which it, um, might work, probably would work, but I usually like to get over 100 stars. So I'm going to bring that back over to 17%. 
and that gives me 147 stars. As long as you're seeing like something between, let's say, 50 and 3,000 stars, it's probably going to work just fine. If you're seeing like 20,000 stars or zero stars, then those are outliers and I think something is going wrong. So then you would really want to examine your files, especially the zero stars. Um, that would mean that you probably didn't get focus right because if it's not finding any stars, then, then it's not gonna be able to stack your pictures. Um, so uh, I, then you're gonna to have to take a look at your files. Uh, you could open them up in Photoshop or something like that ahead of time and see what the issue is. But usually this works just fine and you might even be able to just leave it on the default, but I always like to check it. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna click on recommended settings and what I like to do in here is just sort of scroll through and see if there is anything that is popping up in red. That usually indicates this is something you should address. Um, I mean, it says you are stacking 282 light frames here. That's sort of in red, but I mean where you're seeing all these green statements. What the green indicates is that those are settings that it considers um, already set and that are appropriate. If you're seeing something in red, um, then that means something that you haven't set or, or that you maybe should pay attention to before you start the process. But for the most part, the default values in Deep Sky Stacker work pretty well. If we go into stacking parameters, Um, there's some different options in here, standard mode, mosaic mode, intersection mode. You definitely don't want mosaic mode. That would mean that you get, uh, that's for if you are basically taking a mosaic of the night sky. We also can think of this as a panorama, something like that, where you're, you're putting together a bunch of different pictures to make a bigger picture of the night sky. But what we want to do is actually stack the pictures all together um, to to um, average out the noise in the picture. And for that, you can either use standard mode or intersection mode. Basically, the difference is just that standard mode isn't going to crop away anything. It's going to leave in the rough edges and intersection mode will automatically apply a crop, but I don't necessarily trust it. So I always just leave this on standard mode and do the cropping myself afterwards. Okay, um, you wanna use all available processors down here at the bottom. Don't wanna turn on any um, drizzle or aligning of RGB channels. Usually um, this thing, you know, the different uh, clipping modes work just fine in the defaults. I have uh, the lights on Kappa Sigma clipping with a Kappa of two and then darks, flats, and bias are all on median Kappa Sigma clipping. I have alignment set to automatic. The intermediate files, this is sort of interesting. You can either choose TIFF or FITS, so that if you were working with other ast astronomy programs, you might choose FITS, which is the more standard for astronomy programs, but since we're gonna be working mostly with just Deep Sky Stacker and Photoshop, um, TIFF files are just fine. This is interesting. Um, if you are finding that even with your calibration frames, your darks are mostly supposed to, are the ones that are really supposed to take care of hot pixels. But if you find that you, you stack and you calibrate and stack and everything, and then your result still has a lot of hot pixels, you might want to try this um, cosmetic correction right here where it can try to detect the hot pixels that are remaining automatically and um, change the value of those so that they're not as noticeable. Okay, we want to create an output file. The autosave.tiff is fine. So basically my point here uh, is that I'm just using all of the defaults. Um, I'm on standard mode for result. And I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And click okay again. And it gives us a final um, summary of everything that uh, we've Hold it here. Um, you can see that I did 200, I have 282 light frames at ISO 1600. 
Um, you can see my bias darks and flats are also all at ISO 1600. Because we have 282 light frames at two seconds each, that's a total exposure total integration of nine minutes, 24 seconds. Um, and the process will temporarily use 31.2 gigabytes on the D drive. So you can imagine if we instead had over 500 frames, um, this may take up something like 60 gigabytes. So you can see these temporary files really do add up. Um, so just make sure you have enough space um, before you start. I don't think it will actually let you start the process if you don't have enough space. Um, but remember, if you, if you want to set that temporary drive to some other place, just go down here to settings and uh, you, can, you can set that temporary drive wherever you wish. Okay, this all looks fine. I'm going to go ahead and click OK again. And now it's the waiting game. Um, basically, this uh, can take hours. Uh, it really just depends on how uh, modern your computer's processor is, how many threads it has, that kind of thing. Um, I don't believe uh, Deep Sky Stacker has any GPU acceleration, so it's really just using your CPU. And the really, again, the most important thing is, uh, is just if it's a more modern, more powerful processor, um, this will go faster. I'm just using um, a Lenovo ThinkPad. It's a few years old, so I know this is gonna take my computer hours to finish, but that's fine. Um, I'll sometimes, you know, take a break and do something else or leave it overnight and then uh, pick it up in the morning. So um, I'm gonna fast forward or skip this part of the video and uh, we'll see what it looks like when it's all done. Okay, it did take a few hours. I actually just uh, waited overnight and this is the next morning and we have a finished uh, picture here. This has been uh, calibrated, registered, and stacked. Now, it doesn't look like much right now, but this is completely normal. This is actually what you want to see. You don't want it to look uh, bright at this point. You want it to look black with only a few white dots. Um, this is because it's unstretched or in a linear form still. And then we're going to do the stretching and all of the um, linear to nonlinear curve work not here in Deep Sky Stacker, which is a fairly uh, crude way to do it, but in another program like GIMP or Photoshop or etc. Um, so to it actually is already saved. Um, so if you look right up here, um, it tells you where it's saved. So it's saved in my lights folder as autosave.tiff. The only issue with this autosave.tiff file is that it is a 32-bit floating point file. And some programs, um, I know GIMP, um, and even some versions of Photoshop um, won't play well with that 32-bit file. So what I would recommend um, you do just to make sure that you have compatibility with the programs we'll use next is go over here to the processing um, section on the left-hand side and go down to save picture to file. And this lets you save off a 16-bit TIFF file, 16 bits per channel, which is what we want. Um, the default settings here are the ones you want, compression set to none, and under options, you want embed adjustments in the saved image, but do not apply them. You want that checked. And so then I'll just save it as Lagoon DSS for Deep Sky Stacker, and click Save. And then we can see here on my desktop, this is what I'm going to bring in to the next program, lagoon-dss.tiff. Um, and then while we're here, I'll just mention really briefly, if you do want to reuse your master bias frame in future projects, what you can do is in that folder at the bottom, you should see something called master offset ISO whatever dot TIFF. And this is what you would save to reuse. Um, uh, and you don't have to reshoot bias frames because they're technically the same. Um, every time, as long as you shot them correctly. Okay, that's it for Deep Sky Stacker. We'll move on to the next uh, section, which is the fun, creative part of uh, processing and really bringing this data to life. Okay, I've switched over to my Mac just because that's where I happen to have GIMP installed, and I've brought over the uh, 
stacked file from Deep Sky Stacker. And so I'm just going to open up uh, the GNU image manipulation program. I'm on version 10.2.10, .10, sorry. And I would recommend uh, version 2.10, uh, especially if you're doing astrophotography because it supports 16-bit uh, files. Well, I think earlier versions uh, did not. So we're just going to go ahead and do file open. And I'm going to pick my uh, TIFF file here from the desktop. Okay, and uh, for some reason, when it opens, uh, it doesn't fit to view, at least on my version of GIMP here. So I'm just going to go to view, zoom, and do fit image in window. There we go. So now we can see the whole image right here. Um, if we if you want to zoom in at any point while processing, um, it's just the plus button. Um, and on most keyboards, you do have to hold down shift and then hit the equals button to get to plus. And then it's just the, the dash or minus key to zoom out. So shift equals or plus to zoom in and minus to zoom out. Okay. Um, and then you can always, of course, use the menus up here. I'm going to try to avoid doing um, many keyboard shortcuts just because they might be a little bit different if you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, only other thing I'll mention here is I have my um, system set up uh, just like GIMP comes out of the box, um, but uh, we're going to be using histograms a lot. So uh, up here at the top, you'll see brushes, patterns, fonts, document history, histogram. I'm just going to switch over to histogram. And if you don't see histogram, just go into um, uh, Windows, Dockable Dialogs, and find histogram in here, right there. And uh, just open it up and, and dock it over here to the right side, because we're going to be using it a lot, especially here at the beginning. OK, um, so by default, the histogram will be set to value. The first thing that I want you to do is switch it to RGB. Um, and it doesn't look like much changed, but uh, what we'll see is that we can then see the red, green, and blue channels separately um, rather than just one uh, histogram bump. We'll see the three channels um, as separate uh, mountains or peaks. And uh, then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this TIFF layer down here in the Layers panel. So I'm just going to right-click on it and choose Duplicate Layer. And if you ever want to rename a layer, you can just double-click and uh, type something else in. So I'm going to type in uh, first stretch. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and stretch it. So we're going to do that using the levels command, and that's under the colors menu. So go up here to the top of your screen and click on colors and uh, go down to levels. OK, and for a first uh, stretch, we can just use um, the default channel, which should be set to value. And just take your mid-tone slider and drag it over until you see some uh, background here in the picture. Uh, basically, you should start seeing, if you did shoot the lagoon, a little bit of the, the Milky Way come out. Um, so just, just stretch it until you see a little bit of the Milky Way, and then hit OK. OK, and now I want us to look at our, our histogram up here, because it really illustrates that we do have a color balance issue, where um, the green and the blue mountains are basically perfectly aligned, while the red mountain is is over here to the left. So the first thing that I want to do is try to color balance this a little bit, um, because uh, it, right now it's a little bit out of whack. And when you look at the picture, you can tell because it looks sort of teal, like a blue-green, uh, rather than a more uh, neutral color. Like the, the, over here should be just basically like a black sky, and here in the middle should be the, the brilliant uh, yellowish gold of the Milky Way. Okay, so let's, um, instead of using color balance, I'm, we're going to do this with levels because we, we're going to be stretching and color balancing at the same time. So just go to color levels again. This time, though, I want you to change the channel from value to red. And then bring it over here a little bit um, so that it's not covering up the histogram because this is a live preview. I think uh, that's another change in newer versions of GIMP that's very handy uh, to be able to have a... Uh, uh, make an adjustment and see a live preview over here. So we're going to take this mid-tone slider 
and drag it over a bit. And you can see the, the, the histogram immediately uh, changed because it's reacting to this, which has is in preview mode. And we went too far because then now the red, it's uh, you can tell obviously in the in the picture it looks sort of a rubyish red, and then the the red peak here has surpassed the blue and green peaks. So I'm going to back off a little bit. Okay, and at this point. Um, you can see that they're pretty well aligned. Um, we at least uh, over here on the shadow side of the peak, they, they seem to be perfectly aligned. Over here on the highlights, we do have a little bit um, uh, more red. Um, but what I'd recommend is we'll just leave that alone for now because um, it may be just the red nebulae already peeking out, like the lagoon down here um, and in other places. Um, so let's go ahead and hit OK. And it looks pretty boring, it looks pretty gray, but that actually is indicating that you have a better color balance. If, it, if, it, if the background and, and the, the whole picture just takes on a certain color, that means that your, your colors are, are out of whack. Um, so let's go ahead and brighten it up a bit though so we can see what we're doing. So I'm just gonna to go to levels again. And once again, take this uh, mid-tone slider and drag it over. Um, but this time I'm also gonna take the shadow slider and drag it to the right a bit. And this will add contrast. So, so far we've just been um, uh, stretching in one direction, basically just uh, bringing it up but the other part of stretching is we want to basically widen out the image, add dynamic range um, by uh, stretching out this, uh, this peak. So basically having uh, more shadows and more highlights. And the way to do that is to move the shadow slider to the right and the midtone slider to the left. And then you're adding um, or stretching out the image by uh, making the dark parts of the image darker and the, the bright parts of the image brighter. Um, and adding contrast. And basically what I do is I just use this levels command a few times until uh, the picture looks like something that I would wanna work with um, with the other tools. And basically I'm, I'm there right now. So um, this is looking pretty good. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see that the lagoon and the Trifid are coming out. Those are the main deep sky objects I was interested in capturing. And you can see we do have some nice detail already. And the, the stars are looking pretty good too. I can see that we do have some star color. Um, but in this zoomed in view, what I'm gonna do next is I wanna add some saturation because um, right now it looks pretty washed out, um, very low color. So I'm gonna go to back to that colors menu and choose saturation and just increase the scale here while looking at my image. Okay, I increased it to 1.65. If I turn the preview off and on, that's before, very gray, and that's after. And you can see the, the image is, is popping out a little bit more and some of these bright um, stars, though, have you know really nice color like orange and blues and reds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and apply that and then I'm just gonna do another, actually at this point, instead of doing levels, I'm gonna use curves. Um, the basic difference between uh, levels and curves is a levels command is basically just like taking a, a dot right here in the middle of the curve and pushing it straight up um, and taking a dot down here at the, the bottom and pushing it straight to the right. Um, well, with the curves command, as, as opposed to the levels, you can place your points anywhere. So I could take a point here and bring it down like that, and take a point right there just above it and take it up like that. And you have to be careful with this because you can get into a sort of unnatural look very quickly if you, if you, do, if you do something too dramatic. You can see how that looks really gross. Uh, like <laughs> it, it just, it's killing a lot of detail somehow because I've just done something too unnatural in the curve. So I'm gonna go ahead and reset it. Um, so 
be careful with curves. You always want to make pretty uh, subtle adjustments, especially early on like this, but it can give you a little bit more power here. And basically what I like to do is just add in some contrast with a slight S curve. So it's basically just like we want to take this shadow point down a little bit, just take a point there and bring it down, and then take a point up here on this side of the histogram and bring it up a little bit. But I don't necessarily wanna bring this too far up or I'll start clipping um, highlights pretty quickly. So I'm just going to control that with a couple more points up here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and say okay. Let me zoom back out and see how this looks. It's looking really nice, um, at least in this half. This half is really wonky, and the reason is is because of registration artifacts. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, because of the drift of the image over time, um, we need to crop this away because this is very low uh, signal, high noise area that uh, is only in some of the many hundreds of shots that we took. Um, but but not very many, and that's why it just looks really strange. So let's go ahead and crop now. Um, I'm just gonna grab my crop tool here over from the tool bar. It's right there. And I'm just gonna crop, you know, by, uh, by the look of it, um, where I think that we have um, fairly good signal, which I think is right here sort of in the middle, but a little bit to the right of middle. And what I really want to include is the lagoon, and I want the top of the image to be the, the eagle. Um, so we have eagle, omega, trifid, and lagoon all in one picture. Okay, so I'm gonna try that. And I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I think that's looking really good. Um, and so uh, we could just, you know, continue doing more saturation, more curves, and basically get this picture pretty close to uh, finished very quickly now. Um, I'm going to show you something a little bit special, which is uh, which can really add some pop to an image like this, um, which is a technique for separating the stars from the rest of the image, from the, the Milky Way background and the nebulae, and then um, enhancing the Milky Way and the nebulae without the stars and then adding the stars back in. And it just really gives it something a little extra. Um, and I'm going to use a free program to do that called Starnet++. It's not something you can add into GIMP. You have to use it as a standalone program. So um, since it's a standalone program, we have to save off what we have right here as a 16-bit TIFF and bring it into the command line program of Starnet, and then it will make the starless version, and then we'll, we'll bring it back in. All right, there's one thing we do have to do before we save it off as a TIFF uh, to bring into Starnet, which is get rid of this alpha channel. Uh, unfortunately, we can't just delete it. We do have to actually uh, flatten the image. So to do that, we just go to image, flatten image, Everything is now one layer, and over here in the channels, you should just see red, green, and blue, and no alpha channel. And then we can go up here to File, Export As, and go ahead and save it. We do File, Export As. The default option seems to be TIFF, so that's good. But if it isn't, just type in .tiff right there. And then I'm going to call this Lagoon for Starnet. And export to my desktop. I'm gonna turn off save layers, we don't need that. I just want the, a single layer, click export. Okay, and there we go, we have Lagoon for Starnet right there. Okay, so from Google, I'm just going to um, search for Starnet++ plus plus like that. And the first uh, search result here is this sourceforge.net download site, and that's what you wanna to go to. And then uh, go over here to Files. And if you do have PixInsight, you can get the PixInsight module. But um, assuming you don't have PixInsight, we're gonna just get the standalone version. 
And so you would just go into version 1.1 here and then pick your operating system. So if you're on Windows, pick Windows or Win. If you're on Mac, pick this Mac OS. And if you're on Linux, pick the Linux one. And I'll just click on that. And then it will start downloading here. Okay, it's finished downloading. So I'm just going to open up those, uh, open up the zip folder and put it on my desktop. And if you look at the README, this is where it's going to give us instructions on how to use it. Okay, and basically we just have to look at this little um, shell file here. Uh, this is a, just a little command that's given. Um, and if we open that up, I'm just gonna open it with um, a text editor, but you can open it with uh, any kind of text editor, it doesn't matter. Um, all we're gonna do is just change this right here to the name of our file. So I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna say lagoon for starnet.tiff. And then I want the output to just be lagoon starless. And then the last thing here is I'm just going to change the stride number to 32. What that means is that it will take a little bit longer to process than with a stride of 64, but it will give us a better result for, for removing the stars, um, especially with uh, wide field images like this one. I'm gonna go, go ahead and save that script, close out of that. Okay, with that done, we've edited the script, 32-bit uh, stride, it has the right file name. Um, we can go ahead and run the script. The way we do that is through a command line uh, program. So I'm just gonna use the built-in um, command line program on Mac, which is terminal. And to run it, we have to do two things. We first have to move to this directory. So I'm just gonna type in cd space to do change directory command and then drag this folder over. So cd space and then go to the folder, hit enter. We're now inside the folder. And from there I can run this command just by dragging it over and hit enter again. Okay, and then it starts its thing. Um, it uh, reads the file, it tells me, yep, it's a 16-bit file with three channels. Here's the height and the width. Here's the uh, CPU I'm using with TensorFlow. Um, and then uh, this is the number of tiles that it's gonna break the file up into, and then it's going to look at each one and remove stars from those tiles and then recombine the image. And then down here, it tells me how long it's gonna take for that to happen, um, a percentage as it's going. And uh, you can see it just went from zero to 1%. So it does take quite a while, probably at least an hour, maybe two um, on an image of this size. Okay. Uh, now that that's done, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the Lagoon Starless image back up here into GIMP. And the first thing that I'm gonna do with this Starless image is just apply a curves adjustment using colors. And the cool thing is we'll be able to stretch it much further because we don't have the stars to worry about. And I'm just gonna apply a slight uh, saturation bump to it too. All right, that looks good. Um, and then we are just going to take our star image here. So we'll do edit, copy visible, and paste it onto this image. I'll just do paste in place. And then I'm just gonna click this little create a new layer button here. They call it pasted layer. I could rename it stars. I'm gonna change the mode from normal to screen. Okay, and you can see that made the image a lot brighter. We now do have the stars in addition to this enhanced starless version. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit. 
There we go. Um, so now it's just really just resetting the, the black point. Um, so I'm just going to uh, make a new layer from visible just by going to layer new from visible. And on this new visible layer, I'm just going to do colors curves and bring in the black point here a little bit and hit okay. And that's it. I think this image is done and it's really nice looking. Um, if I zoom in here, You can see, I think this Lagoon and Triffid looks uh, quite nice considering this is under 10 minutes of total integration. Of course, if we wanted it to not look as noisy as it does when you zoom in, you would just wanna get more uh, total integration, so more pictures. Um, but for under 10 minutes, untracked, I think this looks pretty good uh, for a nice core Milky Way shot. Um, and finally to save, if you wanted to come back into uh, GIMP, you would just wanna do file save as and save it in GIMP's um, default format, which is XCF. So I could just call it lagoon.xcf. And that way uh, you have a nice master that you can come back to and uh, continue editing if you change your mind about any of your choices. Um, and for saving to the web, um, usually you want a smaller file that's compressed. So I usually use uh, JPEG. So I'll just do export as and switch the file ending to JPEG, JPG, and click export. And it gives me a few options. I'll do 100 for the quality and click export. Okay, and then if I look on my desktop here, there it is. I can bring that open into preview and view it full screen. Okay, and there is our final result out of uh, GIMP. Um, if you uh, want to see a comparison I did, um, to a uh, modified camera, check out the Photoshop version of this. I'm not gonna do that for every program, but I think this came out really well. Um, I really like uh, the colors and details uh, with this GIMP process of the stock 60D, uh, 10 minute total exposure using two second exposures with a Canon Nifty 50, untracked. If you have any questions about this process, uh, please ask them in the comments and uh, Till next time, this is Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com. Clear skies.